1 Corinthians chapter 9 today, 1 Corinthians 9. Today we come to the final message on the struggle for self-control. If you want to be an overcomer, then this is an area of your life you definitely want to grow in. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. When Brian Dawkins was here, Eagles Hall of Fame uh, uh, player, Brian Dawkins spoke about this when he was here. In fact, he said, he said, if you, he said, if you take care of your body when you're young, your body will take care of you when you're old. And that was some good advice that he passed on to us. Here, the Apostle Paul, he uses himself on the how-to to win the battle for self-control. Now, the first two messages, and you can check them out online if you would like or to review them, that gave us the foundation for this message. If you attempt self-control, self-discipline without God's help, you are destined for failure. One of our founding fathers, Ben Franklin, created a list of 13 virtues in his attempt to arrive at moral perfection. I have his autobiography, and uh, he, he even created a little chart that he put in the book that he wrote. Uh, after he would perfect one virtue for a week, he would move on to the next one. He found out that he kept failing in the previous ones. He recorded it all down, uh, and so here you see, you see every spot that he put means that he failed in that area in that day. So he finally acknowledged, he said, I never arrived at perfection. I never arrived at perfection. Ben Franklin did not understand the nature of man. Every man, every woman, every teen, every child, every baby has a sinful nature. Galatians 5, 19 to 21, it actually gives us a list of the ugly works of the, of the flesh. And that's who we are. I mean, you can dress us up in a tuxedo, uh, bib overalls, it makes no difference. That's just who we are. We will never be free from the struggle of our flesh until we see the Lord in heaven. We've discovered that self-control, as you see in your notes, is a fruit of the Spirit called temperance. Galatians 5, and 23. So it's a virtue. It's a virtue that is, is a growing work of God in our hearts. And so the more surrendered we are to God and to his word and to his will, uh, the, uh, the more the Holy Spirit will control, he'll control our words and our attitudes and our actions. And the more this fruit, this virtue will show up in our lives. Now back in chapter 6, uh, the Apostle Paul said that our bodies belong to God, therefore glorify God in your body, verse 20 of that chapter. And then Paul gave us the why to have self-control. Uh, he gave us the motivation, because as we live our lives as Christians, we're living for the AO1, the audience of one, for God. We're living for God, because we'll all give an account to God at what the Bible says is the judgment seat of Christ. This is for Christians. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. We're not going to give an account for our sins as followers of Christ. All of our sins have been placed upon the cross and the penalty's been paid. But since the moment of our salvation, the moment we became a follower of Christ, I'm not talking about baptism, I'm not talking about confirmation or sacraments, the moment that we made a conscious decision to give our hearts to Christ, from that moment until the moment we step into heaven, God is going to review our life and give, we're going to give an account. He wants to reward us at the judgment seat of Christ. And so Paul describes, he was an avid sports watcher, uh, and he describes this Christian life we're living as a race, an Olympic race, which they would have been well familiar with. But in the Olympics, only one wins. But in the Christian race, everyone can win. Please stand with me as I read this just tremendous passage, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24. We have it on the screen there as well. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run, that ye may obtain, that you may win, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate. There it is, self-control, self-discipline. Every man that strives, every man that runs, 
and, and trains. He, for the mastery, is temperate in all things. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown, a crown of leaves, a gold medal, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep unto my body, and I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we thank you that we have your word to teach us and to guide us in the very practical areas of our lives. Lord, help us not just to live for the temporary, help us to live for the eternal. Help us to know that you want to display your glory through us and you do that best when we are living lives filled with love and grace and peace and joy and holiness and service to you and others. Father, I pray now through anyone here or watching online and they're just not certain when they die if they go to heaven. I pray today they might understand you brought them here today to hear this wonderful message of the free gift of salvation. May they receive it into their heart and have the indwelling Spirit of God giving them peace and assurance that they belong to you. Father, many have questions. May you answer those questions. I pray now for each Christian, some who, who, who may feel defeated today and discouraged, uh, I pray you'd encourage their hearts, whether it be in marriage or family or work or health or just life in general, God, help us to be overcomers, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. Delayed gratification. It's just hard, isn't it? Do you have self-control? Did you have it when you were a kid. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. I'm gonna go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. Oh, it smells really good. So I'm gonna leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you to give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> Okay, which kid were you when you were four and five and six? You know, 1972, the Stanford study, they actually followed those kids years later, and they discovered that the kids that waited 
delayed gratification. They waited the 15 minutes to get the two marshmallows. They followed them, and they found out that they did better in life later on. They found out that even their SAT scores were better. An important topic. We all face the marshmallow test every day. It just comes in different forms. The popularity test, kids and teens, what will you say and do to be popular? The purity test, young adults, will you choose God's plan for intimacy? The patience test, uh, for moms and dads and sons and daughters, will you be patient with your family members and husbands and wives? The pride test, will you handle success with humility? The, uh, the pious self-righteous test, Will you embrace fresh ideas or be critical? And we all face the discipleship test. Will you choose to be like Jesus? What is self-control? There in your notes, self-control is choosing to do what's right when you feel like doing what's wrong. It's knowing you can, but deciding you won't. You sit down, here's one, you sit down with your kids or your grandkids on family night. Self-control is not eating all of the popcorn before the movie or the ball game starts. Self-control is the ability to make progress toward a goal even when you're not in the mood or when you feel in the moment that you would really enjoy doing something else. Self-discipline is related to the word democracy. It's, it, it is governing yourself. It frees up your life to be the person that God made you to be, to do really what God wants you to do. Uh, Paul Harvey, who, who has, uh, still holds the title of the most listened to radio commentator in U.S. history with over 24 million uh, viewers or listeners daily, he said, self-government... Let's go to the next slide. Self-government won't work without self-discipline. Oh, how our leaders need to be able to sound that message out today. On page two, why is self-control such a struggle? Well, the Bible tells us in Galatians 5, the flesh the old nature lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary. There's a battle uh, the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. The Christian life is a battle between two natures on the inside. Your greatest adversary and obstacle is the person you look at in the mirror every morning. The two natures, our sinful nature and our new spiritual nature. Let me share a little poem that contains this truth, but it also contains the key to your success in this struggle. Two natures beat within my chest. The one is foul, the one is blessed. The one I love, the one I hate, but the one I feed will dominate. Isn't that true? You have to take control of which of your two natures you are going to feed. And so if you spend the majority of your time feeding the old nature, the sensual, through worldly entertainment, uh, whether it be television, news, social media, worldly music, you're going to become the lukewarm Christian. If you are into pornography, for example, you're on the road to self-destruction. Why? You're feeding the old nature, and your old nature has one purpose, and that is to destroy you and to destroy your influence for God. How to have self-control. Now, these how-to points will only work if you have the right motive. These how-to points only work if you have the right understanding. You see, ha having self-control is not what you do. It's who you are. It's being a spirit-filled Christian. So here we go. Let's get started. Number one, get in the race. Get in the spiritual race. Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You see, you have to be saved. If you've never committed your heart uh, to become a true follower of Christ, you're not even in the spiritual race. All of your, spirit, uh, uh, your, your effort, your service is for nothing. In fact, the Bible says that, that our works are 
are out of pride and are nothing but filthy rags. And so we need to understand, even though I was brought up in a Protestant church, even though I went to, uh, to Sunday school in the younger years and went to a few VBSs myself, uh, uh, the situations happened to my family moving from Pennsylvania to Texas to Virginia. We got to the place where we weren't even going to church at all. If you asked me, do you believe in God? I'd say yes. If you asked me, do you believe in the Bible? I would say yes. If you asked me, do you read the Bible? I'd say well, no, I, I don't even have one. I don't own one. And so I had a, a, a tiny bit of understanding. I knew about God, but I didn't know God. And then God came into my family. My mom and dad both saved, going to church. They took me to church. Here I am, a 15-year-old teenager, and, and, and hearing what I've heard before in the Protestant church, the difference was, this is for me. I need this because because of my sin as a teenager, I can't go to heaven. I need forgiveness. And so there was, a, there was a day after coming to church about four months that I finally understood, like the light went on, I understood, I can't go to heaven with my sin. I need a savior, I need the savior. And I asked Jesus to become my Lord and savior and that hope so that I would go to heaven. Now I have a no so I'm gonna go to heaven. You need to get in the race. You need to take the step of, you say, oh, yeah, I'm not a Baptist, I'm not a Catholic, I'm not a Mormon. No, no, it's not about a religion, it's not about a church, it's about a relationship. You and God, you need God. You need the Lord Jesus in your heart. He will never disappoint you. Get in the race, take that step of faith. Number two, admit your struggles. Paul did in Romans 7. Jesus said, blessed are those Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. He did not say, most people think this, he did not say, blessed are those who are righteous. It's not what he said. He said, blessed are those, happy are those who have a hunger for God, who have a thirst to be able to do right. They understand they don't have what they need, but they desire it. We are blessed when we are unsatisfied with where we are and want to grow closer to God. God has a great, great plan for your life and he invites you to live it for him. Are you hungry for God today? Are you thirsty for right living? And is that what, what, you, what you want? Is that, that's what brought you here today. You came to church. You didn't come for religion. You came to be able to, to meet with God and to hear from his word and to be with God's people. Or you ask yourself, have I accepted coasting in my life? Am I okay with just being the lukewarm Christian? If we are not unhappy with the level of our joy and the level of our love and the level of our, of our holiness that we have in our hearts, nothing will change. If we think we're humble and flexible when we're not, then we are fooling ourselves. Thank God he is giving to you and me a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to want to keep growing closer to God. And you have to have that. So admit, admit your struggle with this. Number three, work on a growing, work on growing good habits. We see that in verse 25. Every man that striveth for the mastery is, is temperate in all things. Olympic athletes, they train rigorously. They train consistently. They train with discipline. One way to master self-discipline is to create new habits. In your spiritual life, the habit of reading your Bible, the habit of taking time to pray, the habit of attending church regularly, sharing your faith, uh, the habit of serving. Uh, begin to read your Bible. You say, well, I just, I start, I stop, I start, I stop. And so you get the same Bible, same place, same time, uh, same journal, same devotional book, and then you meet with God. You just make it a, a habit. That's how you get started. It's true in life. It's true in your housework. It's true in your honey-do list, your upkeep, the maintenance of your home. Life by the yard is hard, but, uh, but life by the inch is a cinch. And so you have a plan. You have a method to your madness. Uh, several moms over the years, including us, you, you create these chore charts for your kids and even for your teens, and, and, and then they can see it, and there can be rewards attached to that. Uh, many moms, they put it on the refrigerator, which is a 
thing of great wisdom, all right? Because they know it's going to be seen uh, especially by the teens. And then uh, your work, office, whether you go to the office, whether, whether it's construction work, whether you work from home, you have a plan, you get to it. It's so easy to become lazy and inefficient. Plan your day, work your plan. Don't procrastinate the important things. Determine your priorities. In the morning, write down your A1 priority. Write down your A2 priority. Write down your A3, and then you get to it. Uh, you can do a Google search of a book called Atomic Habits. Or you can just read the review. It's called The Book, Atomic Habits in Three Sentences, and it's free. It's free, all right? But it would encourage you to be able to, uh, to, to, to uh, group uh, small habits together, and then small habits over a long period of time bring great results. You say, Pastor, is it a Christian book? It's not, not. So in, in the same way that you eat fish, you eat the meat, and you spit out what? Spit out the bones. You say, you're advocating to read outside the Bible? Yes. The Apostle Paul, he, he's in prison. He's going to die. He says, Timothy, bring the books. Bring the books, but especially the parchments. The parchments is the Word of God. You say, how do you know the books weren't Christian books? Because there were no Christian books <laughs> at that time. And so he read widely, but he read with discernment, and you can do the same thing and find great benefit. Number four, set godly goals. Verse 26. Now Paul, he, he gives a personal testimony. He says, I, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one beateth the air. The desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it is an abomination for fools to depart from evil. I believe having godly goals is a good thing. Paul had a goal to share the gospel. He had a goal to have a conscience void of offense before God. And men. He had a goal to go to Rome, and he went. He had a goal to go to Spain. It's not recorded in the Bible. Do you think he went to Spain? I think he did, uh, because when he gets to the end of his life, he writes, I have finished my course. What goals do you have? Do you have spiritual goals? Do you have career goals? Do you have service to the Lord goals? Do you have health goals? Goals that relate to diet and exercise and a joyful attitude. Now, I understand. I understand there are, there are medical issues that some people have, and that's why we're not to be involved in judging others. We should be more involved in judging ourselves and our walk with the Lord. If you're grouchy all the time, then turn off the news and turn on Christian radio, turn on Christian music, listen to good edifying music and uplifting podcasts. Paul said, I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I'm disciplining my body like an athlete training to do what it should do. Our bodies and souls live so close together that they catch each other's diseases, don't they? When I don't feel good physically, it has an impact on my spiritual life. I may need a little extra rest uh, to get better and heal. And when you are down spiritually, it negatively affects your body. If you want to serve the Lord, if you want to serve your family, if you want to serve others for a long time, we've got to take care of our body to control it. Here's a sign on a doctor's office. It's a very important sign. So when you wear out this body, then where are you going to live? <laughs> where are you going to live? Good thought. Number five, tell your body what to do. Verse 27, but I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. Paul says, I keep my body under subjection, under control. I make it my servant. I make it my slave. It is a tool for me to serve God and to serve others. God owns your body. Have you ever argued with your body when it says to you, don't exercise today? Have you ever argued with your body when it says, go ahead and get the second dessert? Have you ever argued with your body when it says, indulge on those social media posts? Go ahead and laugh at those crude jokes. 1 Timothy 4, 7. Exercise yourself unto godliness. Do you ever have a conversation with yourself? Well, all the time. 
Right now, you're talking to yourself saying, well, I agree with that, I don't agree with that, all right? <laughs> it's a good thing I can't hear it. Uh, how about a conversation with your body? You know, the older I get, the more I need the, this passage and these four verses. There are some days when my body tells me that it doesn't want to obey me anymore. Go figure. I have arguments with my body. I talk back to it. My body wants to sleep when I need to get up. My body wants to overeat when I have eaten enough. My body uh, wants to stop exercise, exercising when I need to. My body uh, wants drugs or alcohol, but I need to say no. My body resists the effort to pray and read my Bible, but I cannot let the body win that battle. My body wants to give up when the going gets tough, but I must go on. And in order to conquer your body, you need to get tough with it. You need to learn a little word and say it. And that's the word no. You need to say no to your body. You're in charge, your soul and spirit. In order to conquer your body, you need to learn to say no. Three areas. Say no to yourself. And he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Say no to the easy way. Say no to self-indulgence. Say no to procrastination. And then say no to others. Say, Pastor, really? You're saying say no to others? Yes, there's a time to say no to others. When others would steal your time frivolously, you need to learn to be able to say no. Pray for them. Pray with them. But say no. If they want to be able to take time, a sales reps can steal our time at work and home. Ben Franklin said, dost thou love life? Then do not squander time, for that's the stuff life is made of. And then say no to Satan. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You have to run the race according to the rules, and God wrote the rule book. God gave the Ten Commandments that we need to follow. So here we go. How to have self-control, number one, get in the race by receiving Christ as your Savior. Number two, admit your struggles. Number three, work on growing good habits. Number four, set godly goals. Number five, tell your body what to do. Now let me give you a practical help on that. Number six, begin to control your tongue. Begin to control your tongue. I keep under my body, I bring it into subjection, lest, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, Referring to what he is saying, when I preach to others, Proverbs 25, 28, he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. You see, in ancient times, uh, for a city to survive, they needed two things. They needed water. Uh, without water, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna die, and they need walls. Uh, without walls, they're going to be uh, defeated. For many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, a, a, a mature man or woman, if they're able to bridle uh, the, the, the tongue in the body. If you want to control your body, start controlling the tongue, the things you say. Start with controlling the two and a half ounce of mucous membrane that sets behind your teeth. Uh, it has a direct connection to your heart. In fact, Jesus said, he said, from your heart, the mouth speaketh. In your notes, try this today. Don't say everything you think. Just because you think it doesn't mean you have to say it, all right? Uh, not all words must be spoken. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good uh, to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the others. You know that there's a put off, put on principle there in Ephesians 4, so we put off the lies, the gossip, the cutting sarcasm, the racial slurs, uh, the unnecessary criticism, the cursing, any kind of blasphemy, profane speaking. We put it off. We put on truth and kindness, graciousness, praise and blessing and thankfulness and encouragement. Paul said, will, will you join Paul in saying, I'm going to bring my body into subjection. 
I make it my servant. When I preach to others, I don't want to become a castaway. I don't want to become overboard. I don't want to become a shipwreck. I don't want to, be, want to become disqualified. Paul did not want to spend his life preaching to others and then be disqualified for not being faithful himself. One more, number seven. Don't quit. Don't quit. Finish your race. Hebrews 12, 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Listen, let us run the race with patience that is set before us. And so as you look around this worship center, as, you, as you, you walk up and down the halls through the gathering space and you see your brothers and sisters in Christ, you look at the family of God, we are the joy that Jesus endured for the cross, Hebrews 12, 2. We are the reason he went to the cross. Uh, the, uh, 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 he suffered a Roman crucifixion because he loves you and he loves me. Uh, don't ever think that God is finished with you. If you're still breathing, God has a plan and purpose for you. There are moments in life that we can get discouraged about how things are going in our life. So whatever you're facing, whatever you're struggling with, don't quit. God in heaven is saying through his word, don't quit. Keep going. Keep running the race with patience and endurance. Don't become disqualified. In the 1988 Olympics, in Korea, Ben Johnson was called the fastest man alive, breaking the world record, winning the gold in the 100-meter race. Or did he? 24 hours later, the Olympic Committee asked the Canadian runner to give back the medal, and he did. He experienced the highest moment of glory followed by the lowest moment of disgrace. Question, why would an athlete take an illegal drug knowing there is going to be a drug test? Christian, there's coming a day, and you know it. You know it. There's going to be a test. There's going to be an accounting we're going to stand before the Lord and, and give an account for what we say and what we do and our attitude, our giving, our service. It's all going to be reviewed. What are you doing for Christ? What sacrifices of time and energy and money do you make for him? Everything from the moment of your salvation to the moment you stand in his presence will be judged and tested. It's time to train. It's time to work out. It's time to get in the race and not quit. May we pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word and the inspiration and the challenge that we get uh, from it. I pray that each one of us will understand we are going to stand before you one day. Oh, how we want to give a good accounting. How we want to live our lives loving God, loving others because we live for the audience of one. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed as we come into God's presence. I want to ask you today, if you die today, do you know for certain you'd go to heaven or do you have some doubt? Do you have a Bible reason? And you can say, Pastor, I, I remember a time I'm trusting in Christ alone, not my baptism, not my good works, not going to church, not sacraments, not being sincere, but there was a time that I said, oh God, please forgive my sin because I believe Jesus died for me and rose again. You may not know the date, that's okay. But you remember the moment you gave your heart to Christ and you were, as the Bible says, you were saved. You were born again into God's family. If that's your testimony, again, no one's looking around. We, we, we have our heads bowed, our eyes closed. We're showing respect to our neighbor. Just raise your hand for a moment. You see, that's me. I have that confidence, that peace, that assurance. You may put your hands down. You say, Pastor, I, I think I'd go to heaven. I, I hope I'd go to heaven. Oh, but I'm not sure. I have doubt. I have doubt. The Bible says today is the day of your salvation. 
The day you understand this truth of God's love for you and your desperation to be forgiven, that's the day you're to respond and say yes to God. Can you think of one reason why you should delay another day? I'm not asking you to join the church or to get baptized. I'm asking you to accept God's gift of eternal life, Jesus Christ as your your personal Savior. You say, well, I believe. I believe. Well, I used to believe too, but it was in my head. But then I trusted from my heart. I invite you today to trust from your heart. If the Spirit of God is tugging on your heart, would you say yes? Would you, would you call upon the Lord today? The Bible says if you, if you will call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. Right where you're seated. Whether you're here, whether you're watching online in your home today, would you pray right now with me from your heart? Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he died in my place and rose again. Please come into my heart and become my Lord and Savior. Please give me the assurance that heaven is my home because I trust in you alone heads about or eyes are closed and in the quietness of this moment if you just prayed with me if you gave your heart to Christ and you were sincere in that prayer to the Lord I just want to say to you welcome to the family of God I'd like to pray for you this morning I'd like to pray that you'll experience this peace this assurance that you belong to him anyone here today simply raise your hand hold it up for a moment may I pray for you I'll not call you out I'll not embarrass you in any way. Just slip your hand up for a moment. Hold it up for a moment. I pray with you, Pastor, and I meant it from my heart. Anyone at all, just slip your hand up for a moment that I might see you. Christian, may I ask you, as with me, do you have some room for improvement to grow this fruit of the Spirit of temperance, of self-control. Maybe I've spoken on it in this message today, or maybe the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to you about something else in your life, and you want God's help. We're going to have this song of invitation. As, as Brother Dan sings, would you just take this moment to pray and ask God to forgive your sin, to help you in this area that He points out to you, to strengthen you, patience and love to put off sin to put on righteousness to walk in the spirit to us. Speak to our hearts that we walk in truth and righteousness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.